What's going on, guys? Welcome back to Before the Whistle. I'm your host, Maddie Hudak. And for this fourth episode, I thought it would be a good time to stop and just reflect and bring in what I think is probably my most valuable and unique insight in this industry, which has been serving as Tulane sideline reporter for the last two seasons. It's taught me so much about overcoming adversity, how to build a team of champions to see the light at the end of the tunnel, to go from two and 10 to 12 and two. It doesn't just take place on the field. It's everything that happens before the whistle, if you will. But these guys on this last two lane team, people talk about how back in July, these guys were talking about the conference championship. Well, it really goes back to February, March of that year while I was at spring camp prior to training camp of last year, where these guys were saying that with as much confidence back again in spring practice last year. And at first, yeah, I felt like they were being a little delusional, but in a good way. But as time went by, even through spring camp, just the hard work, the determination, the mental toughness and focus I could already see in these guys, it made me want to believe them. And by the time we got to fall camp, I was fully with them saying, they they make me want to believe that they're going to the conference championship this year. Very similar to when a certain dominant Tulane team picked up a schedule and their quarterback said, hey, guys, I think we can win them all. That quarterback was Sean King, and that team was the 1998 Tulane team that would go undefeated that year and go on to the Liberty Bowl and beat BYU. Um, Arguably and inarguably, they deserved a much bigger spotlight for how dominant of a team that was. Uh, You know, there's a lot of comparisons to be had there, actually more than you'd think. But it's safe to say that in terms of scoreboard, that 98 team was just demolishing anything that was put in front of them. But their first game of that year started in Nippert Stadium in Ohio, where this last year's Tulane team ended their storybook regular season run, uh, ending a 32 home game winning streak and their regular season with a win against Cincinnati to send them as hosts of the conference championship game. And we all know how that went on to Arlington, Texas for the Cotton Bowl, which Funny I just mentioned that because that is where that team went for week two to play SMU in the 1998 season when it was named the Cotton Bowl back in that time. And then both teams played Southern Miss in week four at home. This past Tulane team lost that game due to injuries at quarterback, a block field goal, missed field goal, block punt, and a bunch of other things that went wrong, uh, including the offensive coordinator that developed Michael Pratt being the head coach of the opposing Southern Miss team. But while they were able to beat Southern Miss in 1998, very similarly, it took their quarterback with them where Sean King suffered a wrist injury. Uh, and that was kind of something they had to deal with all season. He'd actually suffered it the week prior against Navy, but that's really when they figured out that it was somewhat of a problem. And it kind of led to them leading, leaning more into this no huddle spread offense that is so prevalent in today's age, but really found a lot of legs under Rich Rodriguez, Tommy Bowden and Sean King in that 98 year. Uh, when these Tulane guys talk about leaving a timeline and a legacy to compare to the standard of excellence to say, in this year, the 2022 Tulane football team did this. Uh, the reason they said that is because that's what the 9098 guys told them uh, uh, about that exact legacy. And that's really the standard of excellence that they were competing against uh, as setting that moving forward. And I think that they proved that they were able to do so. Now, can they sustain that success? That's another story, but It's perfect time, I think, to bring in a guest. He's someone I've wanted to talk to for the longest time now, quarterback Sean King of that 1998 team, just to hear his insight about how that went, how they saw these building blocks prior to the season, much like this 2022 Tulane team, uh, and how he saw those parallels in them and his time in the NFL. With Brock Purdy and this idea that you know he was a rookie starting in an NFC championship game, He wasn't the first one to do that. It was actually Sean King with the Buccaneers, I believe back in 2000. Uh, And he started a long run of two-lane quarterbacks going on to play in the NFL thereafter. Uh, But just his insight about playing quarterback, what's really important at that role, how he sees that in Michael Pratt and and ways that he wants to see him improve and, and get that attention heading into next year's draft, why a lot of quarterbacks that get drafted don't pan out and It seems like the fix is more simple than we'd think, but it's the most important position on the field. And a lot of the time, these rookie guys just get thrown to the wolves. And why is that? So I think you guys will really enjoy this. If you're a Tulane fan, if you're a football fan, if you're a fan of just a really good story and a fan of quarterback development, I have all that for you and more coming up with Sean King. Well, thank you so much. It was truly last season. I'm sure you're one of the few people that actually 
know what that kind of feels like at Tulane. Um, I, I went there, I graduated in 2016, but I mean, they were nothing like this when I went there on the field. Yeah, we, uh, this is, I think, our 25th year anniversary. So I think everybody's coming to, they play an in-state school early in the season. I think that's the weekend if they're going to do something. I don't know if it's Yeah, is it ever like the Hall of Fame weekend or anything? Yeah, Nicholas State or somebody. I don't know. Uh, Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Earlier on in the season. Cool. Well, yeah, I would love to meet more of the guys from your guys' season. Like I said, I hear so much about it. Um, So that's kind of where I want to start this. Just looking kind of on paper at your guys' season compared to what Tulane did last year. I mean, they went two and nine the two seasons prior and then, you know, seven and four followed by 12 and oh, uh, but I had read something where you had looked at the schedule ahead of the 98 season and you said, yeah, if you put our minds to it, we can go undefeated. And it reminded me of Nick Anderson and then how he kind of manifested that this year. But what, what did you see in that 98 team? And I guess that turnaround uh, somewhat the year before that made you feel so strongly about that. Well, Maddie, it was a, a new regime. It, we were going into the second year under Tommy Bowden as the head coach and second year with Rich Rodriguez as the offensive coordinator. So we were evolving. Uh, a lot of people don't remember this, but, you know, Tommy, of course they remember Tommy being Bobby's son, but coming from Auburn, he was really an eye formation, fullback, tight end, you know, run the power sweep, you know, run the counter type of coach. So – we were not offensively from a scheme standpoint in 97, the same thing we were in 98. So it took Bowden a season to fully, fully trust Rich and trust our personnel to where in 98 we became a spread offense, shotgun, throwing the ball all around the field, very balanced, run pass, but doing it from the shotgun set. So I think that's where our takeoff, you know, started, was the adaptation of a system that wasn't, you know, popular in college football at the time. So, you know, you got to give Tommy Bowden a lot of you know, credit for for trusting Rich to really take that offense to the next level. Yeah, I was reading up on that and and using the spread offense and really just kind of running two minute drill offense the whole time. Uh, and I read something where Rich Rodriguez had said something about it's all about tempo and and really that keeping that tempo and control of the offense. Um, were there any struggles, I guess, in, in kind of moving over to that? And how did you really practice that type of game situation uh, in that offseason heading up into the 98 year? Well, it was interesting because uh, the first year was really about being physical, about being mentally tough. You know, it was a lot of yelling. You know, uh, you know, Tommy Bounds, the FCA guy, Rich Rodriguez invented cussing. So, I mean, practice was really interesting at times. But once they found out, the core group of guys that they could depend on, that they knew wouldn't break, wouldn't fold. You know, that second off season was about efficiency. It was about attention to detail. It was about, you know, taking advantage of everything that was presented to us. And and I think that's where we were kind of unique is that, you know, we never really missed. Like if you made a mistake, you paid for it. Like if if you didn't take the right angle on Juwan or PJ or Jamaican or Tony Converse, one of those guys, we were getting yards after the catch. So sort of like me changing backgrounds because for the first time ever, my iPad pops up, uh, temperature too hot. Uh, so as beautiful as it looked, and it is kind of crispy here in Vegas <laughs> in May of 2023. But again, well, I think the first year was about toughness, Maddie. It was about figuring out who really was going to buy in. You know, you see it now on a, on a grandiose scale with Deion Sanders in Colorado him having to turn over the roster. But we endured some of that way back in 97. You know, you have a new regime. Everybody's not going to fit. Everybody doesn't want to fit, you know, so you have to eliminate, you know, those people that don't give full buy-in. So I think that was the difference. And then when we went into 98, like, we never talked about going undefeated. There just was this quiet energy, this confidence, because we knew like we had the pieces to be really damn good. And, I mean, at the time, you know, I'm always a person that, that feels like the truth doesn't have emotions, man. It's just the truth. Tulane wasn't in a position to be talking about going undefeated. We were just trying to, you know, let's compete for the conference championship. Like, we didn't verbalize it, but, like, that was the energy. And then once we started rolling, I mean, 
by the time the season ended, it wasn't even about winning and losing for us. It was about how much we could dominate because we were that confident, you know, um, it, it hell of a group of guys. And uh, offense gets a lot of credit, but, I mean, defense, man, they forced a whole lot of turnovers. They sacked the quarterback a lot. And uh, we were just hell to deal with in 98. I mean, we were talented. We were confident. But we also were disciplined. We played the game the right way. So I think Tommy and Rich did a hell of a job, you know, in that two-year period. And just looking back at the scores alone in these games, I mean, the word I was about to say was dominate. You guys really just came out of the gate. Um, and it's weird looking back, you know, you started in Nippert Stadium. That's where this team ended last year. And then you were in the Cotton Bowl for week two, uh, playing the Navy. And then that same game in Southern Miss in week four, uh, I know this year's Tulane team said that it was really kind of the Kansas State game where they really started to see it for themselves. Do you remember a time during that season where the switch kind of flipped and it was really okay, you know, this is really something that we can make a, a run at here? Well, for us, it was before the season. Like, we knew. Like, when we came back from um, Covington, because we actually did training camp uh, over in Covington. I think it was St. Paul's. Is the name of the school over there, if I'm not mistaken. If, if, I'm, if I'm wrong, correct me. And we knew. When we got off that bus from Covington, we knew. We knew we were ready. Um, we knew that we had the talent. Um, so there wasn't any internal um, hesitation. It just was about proving it. And uh, if you go back to that first game, I mean, we weren't favorite versus Cincinnati. You know, we kicked their butt. And they had kind of been like the one of the big dogs in what was then a new conference in Conference USA, you know, when uh, – just kind of from there, we just started rolling. You know, uh, it was a very, very unique situation. I've been on a lot of great teams in my life, but that one was the confidence that, you know, existed was was rare. Like, I mean, we really, really felt like we were the, the best thing in the country. Like, we wanted Tennessee at the end of the year. Like, we wanted to play T. Martin and the Vols in the Natty. Like, that's how we felt. Like, going to the Liberty Bowl was like a letdown. Like, we were debating whether we were going. Because, like, that's just the confidence that we had gained. So, uh, hell of a season, man. Hell of a season, hell of a group of guys. And you keep bringing up, you know, buying into this and Tommy Bowden and Rich Rodriguez. And and you actually went on to have a, a career in the NFL. And everyone talks about Brock Purdy being a rookie to start in that championship game. Well, you were the first one to do so uh, under the Buccaneers and, and played so with confidence and – I think coaching goes so under the radar sometimes, but how much did they really, you know, mean to your career and your development as a quarterback? They, they meant a lot. I mean, they were everything, man, because, you know, if we're being honest, if a, a six foot one, you know, black quarterback wasn't like the common thing in, in the nineties, even the late nineties. So I really think my draft class, you know, kind of started this evolution that we now see in the NFL. So, I mean, we're up against it, running a spread offense, you know, being aggressive, you know, from start to finish, you know, throwing. That wasn't normal. You think uh, the run and shoot was what they called, you know, those Houston, University of Houston offenses because they threw the ball around. Now that's just everyday offense. So, you know, being a trendsetter, you know, you know, playing the game outside the box, it wasn't a common thing. So uh, they came along at the perfect time, you know, um, and it all works. You know, I haven't been a coach now. I just always go back to buying because every system's a good system if the team buys into it. You know, that's why a Navy or an Army that runs an option, you know, that's as predated offensive you can get. But they buy into it, and they have a high level of success. And, you know, I think that's what separated that team was just the full buy-in from the, the best players, you know, down to the guys that were the scout team, guys from week to week that gave us great looks. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think that buy-in is so important. Um, just kind of thinking about your time as a coach too. It's interesting to me because you were a quarterback coach and then you switched to running backs, if I'm correct. Uh, and that's always, I think a very unique relationship, uh, the quarterback and the running back back there. So how is that kind of switching for you for coaching and what insights from playing quarterback were you kind of able to apply to that running back role as a coach? Well, this is interesting because I didn't switch. I got switched. <laughs> and I got so frustrated with getting switched, Maddie. I switched back to broadcasting. So, <laughs> so not. Because <laughs> I actually was covering. I hadn't thought about coaching. I was covering um, 
the Super Bowl, it was uh, Cam Newton and Carolina versus Peyton Man. This is Peyton's last game when uh, Denver beat them out in San Francisco. I was there for NBC. I was working for NBC and Yahoo. Had just signed a new four-year deal. And um, Willie Tiger called me while I was there. He was like, will you please come help me with my quarterback, Quentin Flowers? And so I thought about it. And I was like, okay. You know, so I went. Uh, as fate would have it, we were really good. Quentin Flowers won conference uh, American AAC Player of the Year. And uh, Willie Taggart leaves and goes to Oregon. And uh, Charlie Strong gets the job, uh, tells me that uh, he's going, he wants to keep me. And I was, you know, told I was going to be the quarterback coach. And then uh, what's the trend now is now these offensive coordinators, they want to have the quarterback coach title as well. So he ultimately ended up bringing his OC from Texas. And, you know, we couldn't find a compromise because he had always coached his quarterbacks. And so that's why I made the move. The running back, and hey, man, I helped some some really good players, you know, reach the NFL while I was there. So, you know, not upset in any way about those relationships and those careers I was able to help mold. But, I mean, I'm a QB guy. I'm an OC, Matty. I'm just – and if I was going to stay in it, I had to be in those positions. Otherwise, I just I, – I, I'm more happier in broadcasting. Uh, absolutely. I mean, when it's the position you play, and it's really – it's the most important position on the field. And it does seem like – just the development of quarterbacks in general is kind of gone by the wayside. And these last few rookie classes have been a little all over the place, to be honest with you. And I'm always curious, you know, from a for former quarterback, why do you think it's so hard to, for teams to you know, draft and identify the right quarterback and then develop them? Is it just trying to fit a square in a circle peg kind of thing? Or is there something that has kind of not been cultivated, I guess, in, in the development of, rookie quarterbacks throughout college that has kind of led to this all over the place evaluation? Well, I think the first thing is, is not a lot of people can evaluate the quarterback position and even fewer people can develop the quarterback position. And here's what I mean by that. Most offensive centric core coaches come from a specific system. They've mastered that system. So they're experts on the system, but they're not experts on developing different skill sets of quarterback. Meaning if a guy walks into a room and he has a kid that can run but can't throw, a kid that can throw but can't run, and then a kid that can get kind of can do a little bit of both, can he get all three of those kids better? That's a guy that can really develop the quarterback. And there's not a lot of people that can do that out there, unfortunately. That's why you see so many of these quarterbacks with such deficiencies. And a lot of guys are afraid to hold the quarterback truly accountable. You know, they're afraid they're going to hurt their feelings. You know, they're going to bruise their ego when the good ones, the opposite is what makes them great. You know, making them accountable in front of everybody else, you know, making sure that we're the expectation and standard in this room isn't completions, but ball location. It's little things like if you throw the ball in the flat and it's at the back hip of the running back and he catches it and falls down, I'm giving you a, 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 a subtraction, a bad grade for that because it should be upfield shoulder. So Ty J can catch the ball, turn up the sideline and make something happen just because it's just a two lane platform. So I'm just using that as an example. And when I look, quarterbacks get away with not trying to perfect their craft footwork. I'm looking at some of the film last year, guy fading behind the B gaps in the pocket when the pocket is clean, instead of staying static in the A gap, it lets me know he's not seeing things clearly like the mind and the lower body connect. Like, so you could show me a quarterback's lower body for a game, Maddie, and without seeing anything else, I could tell you exactly what kind of game he had. And it's just not a lot of people that can do that. And so the quarterbacks suffer. You know, they, they pay all this money for these, you know, quarterback right. camps and stuff. And, you know, I've been on the other side of that. That's just taking up your time. We're trying to come up with stuff that makes you feel like you worked your butt off by the time this is over to justify whatever it is that we're charging you know, for said camp or tutelage. So, you know, that's what a disconnect is. And it starts in high school. It's spilled over to college. And that's why you see so many of these quarterbacks who think they're going higher than they are because they've been told that they're this when the evaluation on film says something completely different. Yeah, it does seem like the fundamentals have really kind of gotten away. And you just think of someone like Josh Allen where he came in as a completely raw product and then he really took the time to almost kind of go back to quarterback school and learn those kind of fundamentals. Uh, so hey, Maddie, interesting you brought that up. 
Brian Dable is one of the few people that I think can really develop quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. And what you saw was when Dable left, Josh Allen regressed, Daniel Jones got better. Yeah. That's a really good point. Brian Dable is one of those guys in that group that I think is really good at developing the quarterback position. And so how do you kind of identify that? Is it just a guy that knows that it goes down to things like you have to have the footwork down before you can get anywhere else? Uh, or just it kind of just an eye for things? Like, I know we always talk about instinct, but how do we kind of improve this standstill that we're almost at? Like, Is that something that teams should be looking for? Those outside trainers or like you said, can that kind of get into the camps area of getting away from, you know, what really is the issue here? Uh, I think if I had, if I, when Lil Sean gets of age, if he's good enough, I mean, he's only going somewhere where I feel like they can develop the quarterback if that's what he's playing. And I don't care what logo is on the jersey. I don't care what conference is on the stadium. Like, you got to send your child somewhere where they can actually develop the quarterback position. And, uh, again, I, I don't know that it's going to change because the NFL is getting more analytical by the year. And, uh what what's the new test they came up with now? The S two or S T test? Or something yeah, that came from nowhere. And I'm like, uh, okay, he showed he, he scored high on that. But when I watched the film, he's not processing it at the level that this test is saying he's capable of. So where's the disconnect? So we'll, we'll, we'll find out. A guy like Anthony Richardson, listen, super talented. When a kid like that can go top five, who hasn't even had a productive year at quarterback in college. And I just don't think that the position is headed to a, a we got to refine the fundamentals. I think it's let's just get bigger, better athletes and <laughs> we'll figure it out right. as we go. And sometimes, you know, again, getting drafted to a team that it doesn't really make sense on its face in terms of a quarterback skill set, uh, you know, is that kind of on the team to change their offense to kind of cultivate that around the skill set of, whatever quarterback they drafted or would everyone be better off just kind of, I know that it's, we're in a very immediate dividends kind of league, but it does seem like we've thrown a lot of rookie quarterbacks to the wolves in systems that they might not be super accustomed to. Is there more value in that kind of wait and see approach of them sitting for a year? And how much is that really valuable for the mental side of things for quarterbacks? Uh, I think it varies from case to case. Uh, the interesting thing with Anthony Richardson, just because I, I mentioned him, he won't get better standing on the sideline mm-hmm. because he doesn't have a lot of snaps. Trey Lance is another example of a young player that's talented, but he didn't play a lot because of COVID, because of you know him just not getting into football early. He needed snaps. Now there are other guys who have, have gotten a lot of snaps, you know, that maybe can can, you know, mature, grow, develop, you know, watching somebody else initially but but so a lot of these guys because they're not you know five six year you know starters at quarterback it, they need reps I couldn't agree more uh especially with the Trey Lance situation because it just keeps getting years away you know at this point I understand injuries come into play um I think my kind of takeaway from everything you've said is it, it's just so situational and I think the more that we try to apply these rules of you know drafting and developing a quarterback I think you have to really step back and, and look at it from, a, you know, a case-by-case basis. Um, Maddie, think about this. John Lynch, I played with Hall of Famer. Kyle Shanahan, I know really well. Very, very competent football people. Yes. I remember call, I remember texting Booger when they traded up to get Trey Lance, and I told him this will never work. And he said, why? I was like, because you can't take a quarterback that needs reps and put him in a situation where the team has Super Bowl expectations. Because yeah. that's a tough situation where if you don't screw it up, they're going to win big. But if you need reps, you're going to screw it up. And as smart as John and Shanahan are, they still mismanaged trying to upgrade the quarterback position. So just even some really smart people, quarterback just isn't their thing. I, again, yeah. If, if everyone was good at quarterback, then we would see, I think, a little more parity in the NFL than we do. But it's just so obvious that some teams really just have it down and others don't. And this is just to kind of end things on Tulane. You know, I think this is the first time in a while that there really is going to be all eyes on the quarterback role uh, without Tajay Spears being there and them kind of having that season last year. You know, what have you really kind of seen in Michael Pratt as uh, someone that 
talking about reps, he's certainly gotten a lot under center at Tulane, but prior to Tulane, you know, he was homeschooled until ninth grade and didn't play a snap of football until then. So you know, what, what can you say about kind of his growth in just his limited time playing the game? Uh, you know, I've never met Pratt. Uh, we came down and I think we just missed each other. Uh, I think he was headed out and I was just getting there. So I missed him. I don't think I've ever met Michael. Um, I've watched him though very closely. You know, I've watched almost every game he's played and he's getting better. You know, he's always been talented. Um, you know, I think maybe a year and a half ago because he had taken some hits, you know, he mm-hmm. was getting a little gun shy in the pocket at times, but you saw a lot of mental toughness from him this past season, you know, and being able to bounce back. Uh, you know, if I was coaching him, the big thing for me this year would be consistency. I hadn't seen him play at an elite level down in and down out, game in and game uh, out. So, I think that's what if I'm here, if I'm if I'm in charge of his growth this year, we gotta be the dude from start to finish. You know, we've shown highs where we look like we're really, really headed in the right direction, but then they're always kind of followed with these laws where, oh, damn, Mike, how'd you miss that? Or or why'd you do that? So it's all part of the process. You know, uh I didn't reach the height of my, you know, consistent you know, play until my senior year, you know, and mm-hmm. after having made a lot of mistakes. So it's not unique to him. Uh, it's actually exciting because I'm excited to see him this year. You know, after he's had that success, I know he's a hard worker, you know, now taking this thing to the next level, you know, because, you know, with the departure of UCF, Houston, Cincy, if he goes out and has a monster year, no reason he can't be conference player of the year. Tulane can't win back-to-back conference championships. Like, you know, these are the expectations. You know, if I'm him, you know, when I know Coach Fritz very well, I'm sure these are the expectations that they have. I I feel you. It's really that sustained success that, you know, played a role last year, but that this year is really important, I think, for Tulane uh, as a program. Uh, just to say that they have kind of this legacy that they built and have that sustained success because, you know, when during your season, you guys you know, lost your head coach and then things kind of went downhill after that, but they have the quarterback, they have the coach. So all they really need to do this and, year is just make a difference. And you know, it's interesting. I don't think the school gets enough credit for that run we had at quarterback. Because, you know, in 98, we went undefeated. I was the 50th pick in the second round. But then Patrick Ramsey came behind me. He was a first-round pick. And then J.P. Losman came behind Patrick, and he was a first-round pick. And then Lester Ricard came behind mm-hmm. J.P. And I think Lester was like third, fourth round, somewhere in there. So we had four quarterbacks in a row that all, you know, ended up you know, being drafted and playing in the National Football League. And then after that, it kind of, you know, fell off. But, you know, it'd be good to get back to that. It'd be good for Michael, you know, to start like a a, a new kind of thing where, where elite quarterbacks want to come to Tulane. 100%. And, I mean, I think they have a strong room as is now. But uh, just to kind of end things up, I am just curious, you know, thinking back on your time during that year, is there a game that you remember as just your most fun moment or your favorite game or favorite win of that 98 season? Um, There's a couple. Um, We had never beaten Southern Miss. And uh, of course, as fate would have it, I break my wrist and a hurricane hits the week before the Southern Miss games. A lot of, I don't know if a lot of people, even people that follow Tulane, you know, know that story. We were playing Navy and uh, it was an afternoon game. There was a hurricane coming to New Orleans. And during the course of the game, I kind of was rolling to my left. I threw the ball. I braced with my left arm when I went down. And I kind of was like, you know, my wrist felt a little funny, funky, but I played the rest of the game. But after the game, and listen, before you judge, athletics or, or Tommy Bowden. This is pre-cell phones. Like you couldn't right. text, like you know, right. internet was dial up. We get in the game, we get in the locker room, Maddie, and Coach Bowden's like, well, there's a hurricane coming. So we've got a bus that's going to take anybody that needs it to uh, Mississippi. Otherwise, if you guys got uh, places to go outside of New Orleans, y'all just head there. And like, that's how we like dispersed. <laughs> so I went to yeah. back I went to Baton Rouge with my uh my my freshman roommate Oki, and I was like, man, damn, my wrist, you know, it's feeling funky. This is like Sunday, so I called Doctor Brunet, and I called Coach Bowden. I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with my wrist, man, but you know, it's swelling. It ain't went down. 
still like put some ice on it. <laughs> so I got like an ice yeah, pack. Yeah. I'm in Baton Rouge and I'm just icy. I didn't find out I had a broken wrist till like Monday afternoon when we finally got back to New Orleans and we were playing that Saturday. So now the big thing is, you know, what are we going to do? And I'm like, well, not playing is not an option. So you guys would have come up with something. So it took us about three weeks to really come up with the ultimate cast that I end up wearing for the rest of the season. But that's a funny little story that people don't know about. And I was so proud of our team because I couldn't go into center. And so maybe this was a godsend because Tommy Bowden always wanted to be, again, I formation, mm-hmm. old school. And that game, I had to do everything from shotgun. So when we went under center, Jeff Curtis was my backup. Curtis came in the game to take all the under center snaps. He actually made a big completion to uh, rest in peace, Juwan Dawson. We were backed up. And uh, we kind of started going shotgun because I broke the wrist. And that's mm-hmm. when we really, like, started to roll people. But a lot of people may not know that that actually happened, like, right there at the start of that season. Now, they know I had a broke wrist, but they don't remember that. I didn't know it for, like, two days. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, well, I, I kind of did see that reading up on it, but it just makes that season so much more incredible, really, in that context. Yeah, it's like, think about that now, a coach uh, or a university. We just weren't prepared. Like, to right. be honest, like, we, we right. were, it, uh, it was the first time that I'd been at Tulane, that a hurricane, you know, it came. It was, of course, mm-hmm. pre-Katrina. And so uh, I don't know that the, the state took hurricanes or understood the damage a hurricane could do until Katrina, right. you know, because they still weren't prepared when that hit. So, you know, luckily for us, man, you know, we were able to get everybody back. But that was a strange week. <laughs> I'll say. It just, yeah, hurricanes, Tulane, and uh successful seasons apparently it all goes together <laughs> um I hate yeah because to the sh- guys had to go to Tuscaloosa this year right uh, uh we was were, that last year it was last year in Birmingham okay. for gotcha. like 27 days in a renovated hotel it was really not great yeah, um I can listen imagine. I'm I hate to call it cut this short but I have a call at 3 30 that I have to jump on but all this good. is truly Thanks a pleasure, and I would love to continue talking with you more in the future because I think you have a really good pulse on the quarterback role, and as this Tulane season kind of continues, we just love to keep in touch and have you on again. Yeah, let me know. Anything you need, I got you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sean. Great to meet you. All right. Yeah, be okay. blessed. You too. All right, you too. All right, bye. All right, y'all. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview just as much as I did. Again, that's former Tulane quarterback Sean King, who is a headliner of the 1998 undefeated season and shattered a ton of records both at Tulane and in the NCAA along the way, uh, including being, I believe, the only quarterback at Tulane to throw for 300 passing yards and rush for 100 yards in the same game. Uh, I mean, he was just a complete game changer back there and and went on to the NFL. And as I said in our interview, played in the championship game for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I just think he offers so much good insight about developing quarterbacks. You know, with the draft just happening now uh, this last weekend and kind of doing that roundtable on, the most important position on the field, which is quarterback. What's been going on these last few seasons? Because there hasn't been, you know, I guess Bryce Young this year and CJ Stroud, those were kind of your one, two, but but there was no Joe Joe Burrow or Trevor Lawrence or obvious generational talent. And the the quarterback classes like the year of Baker Mayfield, Josh Rosen, Sam Darnold, you actually might want to look back on that and think what went wrong there? Because that was touted as one of the strongest classes there is. And I think a lot of that could be tied back to bad team fits. And that's important. But uh, what Sean brought up, I think, was very simple and very correct in that a lot of the time it's simple fundamentals. It's things like working on your footwork and your lower body mechanics. Uh, for Saints fans, like when Jameis Winston broke his back last year, I had done some research on lumbar fractures and what that means. And that all ties into your lower body. And you could see it in his footwork. You could see that he was unable to plant and throw like he usually did was putting way too much torque into his upper body and it led to inaccuracy and what looked like a lot of painful throws. So in an extreme sense, in an injury aspect, that's where you can see that. But then you think of, again, a guy like Josh Allen who went and worked with a quarterback trainer and actually cultivated a skill set, even though he already had an NFL starting job. I think that's something a lot of guys can learn from, but he's also correct in some cases where it might be better to just get them on the field. I think that some rookie quarterbacks get thrown to the wolves in a system that is not built around their strengths and an offensive line that is offensive more than it is a line. Uh, But for guys like Trey Lance, like he mentioned, that haven't played meaningful snaps yet, there gets to be a point where 
okay, at one point, are you going to be a little too gun shy to actually get over these kind of things in a game setting? Sometimes you have to just be able to work through those kinks on the field while the actual game is playing against NFL defenses that are coming at you with the speed and the size that they are. And all of that just wrapped up again in, in, in what it takes to develop what is the most difficult and important position on the field. But again, just to hear stories told about that 98 season, to hear about Rich Rodriguez, the spread offense, which wasn't the first guy to implement it, but it, it really gets tied back to that two lane year. And I think that goes so under the radar. Like he said, just like the quarterbacks that have been drafted year after year following him, the fact that the spread offense grew a lot of legs back at Tulane, you never really see it in these offensive evolution of the spread offense kind of things. But if they, if any case for a dominant uh, spread offense team, there was that 98 team is exactly that. And I just feel so grateful. Again, I, I say it's about human beings in this industry and no job that I've had so far has taught me that better than being Tulane sideline reporter. And it allows me to meet the brains and minds and people like Sean King. And I just am so grateful to have that chance and be able to hopefully share some insights with you guys along the way. So that's episode four for us today. Uh, I'm going to kind of continue this Tulane centric thing uh, moving forward as the Saints have their rookie mini camp this upcoming Saturday. And uh, Tulane linebacker Nick Anderson will be first on my list for who I'm really looking at. But as I've said, I know that I'm talking about NFL topics as a whole, but there will be coverage of the Saints and Tulane on this program. And so I'll kind of plan to recap that all on Tuesday's episode. And just again, the rookie development, what it takes and any scouting insights I may be able to offer at that time. So please, again, remember to like and subscribe, y'all, if you enjoy this. Uh, we'll, our both Apple Podcasts and YouTube episodes on Fridays and Tuesdays. And as I said, I'll try to keep this format of having a guest every Friday. But I was very grateful to be able to have on Sean King. And roll wave, y'all. I'll see you on Tuesday. I don't know what that hand signal.